Hello, and welcome to the final episode of Let's Learn Blades in the Dark. In this episode, we will discuss crafting. So crafting is a fitting end for this series because it is the most complex set of mechanics in this game. So let's just jump right into it. The text describes it as follows. During downtime, a PC can tinker with special materials and tools to produce strange alchemicals, build or modify items, create spark craft gadgets, or enchant arcane implements or weapons. The system for each method is similar, with different details depending on the nature of the project. And there are many details. There are many, many details. <laughs> so let's discuss them. We'll start out uh, by discussing the types of crafting in the game. So craft products can be alchemicals, they can be mundane items, they can be spark craft, or they can be arcane implements and weapons. So um, something probably involving the abyssal powers we discussed in the, the ritual section, um, something strange and magical. And the important thing to note here is that there are mundane items and then there are all these other strange sorts of items uh, that are more difficult to create. The abilities that are used for crafting in the game are alchemist, artificer, and strange methods. And you might think that alchemist skills uh, can produce alchemicals. Artificer can produce spark craft. Strange methods can produce arcane implements. But there's actually nothing in the rules for this section that says that's the case. Um, so it's kind of left up to the GM to say, oh, this is going to be more difficult because you're not doing something you're familiar with, or there's a complication, or uh, what have you. But there's no like, you must have this skill in order to produce this class of item kind of rule. So crafting has to begin with inventing. Uh, this is similar to acquiring the ritual source uh, that we discussed in the ritual section. So inventing is a long-term project that is rolled with your study action rating and it is accompanied by creation questions uh, similar to the questions that we saw in the ritual section. Also like the ritual section, um, a PC that takes alchemist, artificer, or strange methods uh, gets a free special formula immediately upon taking the skill. Uh, or I should say the special ability. Uh, and what this means is that uh, they only answer the questions, uh, the creation questions. They don't have to fill out a clock. They don't have to do a long-term project. They just get the formula. Having a formula, uh, which is the result of the long-term project, uh, the result of invention, allows a PC to craft the relevant product with a downtime activity. And pre-existing formulas, that is to say something that has been found during play uh, or uh, something that has been invented by a separate PC, uh, can be learned by a PC as a long-term project. So in terms of how this works within a group, um, if one PC does the inventing, uh, and then another PC wants to do the crafting, the crafting PC will have to do a long-term project in order to learn how to craft the inventor's uh, formula. And this just helps to avoid uh, kind of gaming the system by synergizing uh, special abilities in such a way that could be kind of game-breaking. And also it means that if you find a formula on a score, you can't just immediately turn it into some kind of super powerful item. Uh, it's, a, it's a process to make it usable. 
Uh, and this is quite similar to uh, the way that learning magic works in, say, the burning wheel. Now, uh, common alchemicals and ordinary items don't require formulas. Now, the book will uh, tell you what sorts of items these are, but basically you can think of them as things you would normally acquire with an acquire asset role. Um, so uh, these do not require formulas. You can just go ahead and craft them. So let's get to these creation questions that we discussed. The first question is asked by the GM, what type of creation is it and what does it do? So the type here means mundane, alchemical, arcane, or spark craft. Uh, and this is gonna reflect onto the PC's abilities um, it's going to reflect onto the flavor of what is created, um, and it's also important to distinguish whether it is mundane or not mundane. Uh, the player then asks, what's the minimum quality level of this item? So the GM normally decides this based on magnitude. Uh, we previously discussed magnitude, um, and this is something you can find uh, just a few pages back in the text uh, from the crafting section. Um, and normally the GM sets the quality level requirement equal to uh, the magnitude. However, they do have discretion to bump it up or down depending on the factors they're considering. The GM then asks, what rare, strange, or adverse aspect of this formula or design has kept it in obscurity out of common usage? So this is a purely um, fictional positioning oriented question, uh, but it's quite an interesting one because it allows the player to answer, right? And the player can do a little bit of setting definition, uh, world building, by explaining uh, the answer to this question. Um, and they can also highlight why their character is special, right? Why are they more daring than others? Why are they more inventive than others? Um, why are they weirder than others? Uh, you know, these kinds of things they can define by answering this question. So it's a really interesting opportunity to bring characterization into what is otherwise quite a uh, mechanical process. And finally, the player asks the GM, uh, what drawbacks does this item have, if any? So drawbacks, uh, we're gonna discuss at the end of this episode, uh, but as far as the page reference goes, it's on page 225. Now we get to the crafting role itself. So the crafting role involves spending a downtime activity and rolling with Tinker, the Tinker uh, action rating, to determine quality level of the item that is produced. So you roll XD6, where X is the Tinker action rating, and the quality is determined by the highest die result as below, not equal to the die value. It's determined by a result table similar to what we saw in the acquire asset uh, role section of the downtime activities. So here are the results. Here's the table. Uh, if you get a crit, the item quality is your crew tier plus two. If you get a six, it's your tier plus one. If you get a four or five, it's equal to your tier. Uh, and if you get a one to three, it's uh, your tier minus one. Then you add these bonuses. You get plus one quality per coin spent. You can spend coin one for one to increase quality. Um, and you get plus one quality for having the workshop crew upgrade. It'll only give you plus one uh, but it always gives you plus one. It doesn't cost you anything except for choosing that upgrade. Now, the way this is described in the text, 
or um, given a sort of fictional justification is as follows. The results are based on your cruise tier because it indicates the overall quality of the workspace and materials you have access to. So that's why uh, having the workshop upgrade is influential. Uh, that's why your tier matters. Fair enough, makes sense. And because this is a little bit complex, uh, let's go through an example of how exactly it works. So to begin with, the GM looks up the magnitude and sets the minimum quality requirement at three. The player character has a tinker action rating of two. They have a crew tier of one, they have two coin on them, and they have the workshop upgrade. They roll 2d6, they get a result, their highest result is a five, then they check the crafting roll table. Because they got a five, uh, the quality of the item is equal to their tier, which is equal to one, which is insufficient because it is less than the minimum quality requirement of three. However, they add two coin, uh, they spend two coin to increase the quality level by two, uh, and then they get an extra one bonus from the workshop upgrade. This means that their final quality is equal to four, which is greater than three, and therefore more than sufficient uh, to clear the minimum quality requirement. So next, we'll talk about modifying items. So you can create items, you can craft items, uh, you can also modify items, existing ones. These mechanics are a little bit wonky. They're a little bit strange. Um, and this is because, unlike in the case of crafting, where a higher tier will give you better results, in the case of modification, the higher tier you have, the more difficult the roll is to make. So let's, let's go through this. Um, First, let's just, just say that uh, the difficulty here in terms of understanding what's going on is that this directly contradicts the earlier statement about workshop quality being based on tier, right? The higher tier you have, the better stuff you have, the better workspace you have, therefore you're better at crafting. Well, that's not the case here. So let's get into it and see exactly how it works because it's a little counterintuitive. So one thing, um, for modification, no formula is necessary. You can just go ahead and do it. You don't need to go through the long-term project of uh, creating a formula. You make a crafting roll, as we just saw, uh, to modify. And the quality requirements are not equal to magnitude. They're set in a different way. They're set by the GM by uh, them sort of working off their gut feeling of how complex or esoteric the modifications are. Uh, so if the GM thinks the modifications are simple, then the quality requirement is equal to the crew tier plus one. If the GM thinks that the modifications are significant. And again, the difference between simple and significant are just sort of arbitrary criteria that the GM decides themselves. There's no uh, table to refer to or anything like that. Uh, then it is a requirement of crew tier plus two. And if the modification is a arcane modification, a spark craft modification, or an alchemical modification, which is to say it is not mundane, then uh, the requirement is tier plus three. So you can see that, let's say, um, your crew has a tier of one. In that case, making a simple modification would have a minimum quality requirement of two. However, if your tier is four, if you're way up there, 
then making even a simple modification is going to require a minimum quality of five. So the better your tier, the harder it is to do this. Um, so the, the level of difficulty goes up with your tier, which is different from crafting where there is a set magnitude as your target. Um, and then the higher your tier is, the better chance you have of surpassing that minimum requirement. Why is this the case? Um, <laughs> it's a little hard to say. Uh, however, I suspect the logic may be that um, as your tier goes up, you will be better and better at crafting so you can just make better things and you'll have a you know a larger repertoire of formulas um so you can just make better things and you won't have to resort to modifications that's one way you could see it um, another way would be to say that um your tinker role uh, your tinker action rating is going to keep going up as you play uh, therefore it's necessary to keep um, the requirements for success, especially given that there is no formula necessary for doing this uh, in at pace with your tinker roll. Mm, so it doesn't really make any fictional sense the way the mechanic works. There's no like justification you can point to for why this is a logical thing to be in the game world. However, in a very sort of gamey way, it does make a kind of sense in terms of balance. Um, so I think this is a part of the game that uh, may be something that uh, players choose to modify in order to create something that is a little more satisfying. Uh, but it is a functional part of the game. And finally, um, just to talk about what arcane, sparkcraft, or alchemical modifications are, uh, there's some examples from the book to point to. Uh, so for example, an arcane might be a demon slaying dagger. Um, an elk, uh, sorry, a sparkcraft modification might be an electrified boat hull. Um, and an alchemical modification might be a specially coated cloak that masks uh, the wearer's scent, so they can't be hunted as easily. So uh, now let's uh, move on to those drawbacks we were mentioning. Um, uh, first of all, I want to note that uh, drawbacks are something that the GM can apply to either a crafted item or a modified item uh, at the end of the crafting or modification process. Um, it applies to both. The GM can add these to both. They can say, oh, uh, you want to craft this thing? Okay, well, uh, yeah, it's complex, right? There's, there's questions about this uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, crafting questions. Um, so let's start with complex. Um, this is maybe the hardest one to understand, ironically, uh, or perhaps fittingly. Um, <laughs> it says that uh, a complex item uh, requires multiple stages of crafting to make. Okay, fine. Um, which means that one downtime activity and crafting role is needed per stage. So what this means exactly is a little hard to suss out, but here's my best guess. Um, I think that what this means is that for each stage of the crafting process, the GM is going to set a uh, minimum quality requirement and the player character will have to um, pass that requirement in order to proceed to the next stage. If they fail, then they'll have to repeat the stage. And that makes sense. Um, the thing that doesn't quite make sense is the whole crafting role multiple times because 
the crafting roll is not additive. Um, every time you do the crafting roll, it's going to reset the quality of the item you're making. Uh, so that isn't particularly relevant if you have multiple stages. The quality is just going to be whatever your last crafting roll was. So I think it's really a, a question of setting a difficulty uh, level for each stage of crafting. Hopefully that's clear. The next drawback is conspicuous. Uh, this is much more straightforward. Uh, you take plus one heat if it's used any number of times on an operation. So uh, let's say you craft a bazooka, boom, you get heat. Makes sense. It's uh, easy to understand. The next is consumable. Um, this creation has a limited number of uses. So all alchemicals must have this drawback uh, and they're usually one use. Uh, so other things may also be consumable, but all alchemical items are consumable. You just think about like a, a magic potion, right? Uh, you drink it, it's gone. Uh, next is rare. Uh, this is similar to something we saw in the ritual rules. Um, it requires a rare item or material when it's crafted, and you could get this either by uh, conducting a score or uh, doing an acquire asset downtime activity. Uh, the next is unreliable. Uh, when you use the item, you make a fortune roll using its quality to see how well it performs. And I like this one a lot because uh, I like the unpredictability. That's always fun in the fiction. Um, and also, uh, I like how the higher the quality is, the more reliable it is. Um, that can be a lot of fun as well, especially if you know, you're using a classic... Uh, thing like a, a cannon or something like that um, that's like oh well if it's bad quality you're gonna end up like Wiley e. Coyote or something uh, if it's good quality well uh, <laughs> it's the last argument of kings and finally volatile uh, this item produces a dangerous or troublesome side effect for the user specified by the GM there's examples of side effects on uh, page 226 onward uh, so you can check those out for ideas um, and rules wise uh, it's important to note that the side effect is a consequence and may be resisted so every time you use this item it will cause a certain side effect but every time that happens the player is free to make a resistance roll to avoid or to resist the side effect All right, well, we made it, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who has supported this series uh, through your uh, positive comments, through your likes, through your uh, subscriptions, uh, through word of mouth, um, and uh, especially through advice or through um, uh, help with interpreting the rules or corrections to the errors I've made. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a long process uh, to make this series and I'm really happy that it has helped people to enjoy this game. Um, as for myself, what I'm gonna be doing going forward uh, is to work on creating a kind of a thorough 30 minute review of the game. Um, and you can look forward to seeing that on this channel uh, otherwise, uh, check out uh, my Silkworms uh, series of uh, open table uh, Blades in the Dark play uh, if you want to see how I GM the game. I can't say I'm the most experienced or the best GM out there, but uh, you may learn something from it, um, and you may be entertained. So, until then, may the fortune rolls be in your favor, scoundrels.